Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next episode of Kanban for Everyone. My name is Colleen Johnson. I am the CEO of ProKanban.org. And today we're going to be talking about Kanban for personal life. We have an amazing panel lined up for you today, and I'm excited to introduce all of them. I'd love to welcome the panel to the group here, starting with Ingrid Andre, Dimitri. Oh, there's Dimitri. <laughs> there's Ingrid. <laughs> and Tony and Di Maria. So let's go around here, and, and you are all bringing such an amazing perspective into this conversation today. Um, Ingrid is joining us from Brazil. She is a member of Ag uh, Coach with Agile Inc. and a pro Kanban trainer. Ingrid, please welcome yourself and, and announce or share a little bit more about yourself with our audience. Hello, everyone. Like Colleen said, I am a PQ trainer for from ProKanban.org. And today I want to share a little about my wedding adventure using Kanban. Love it. Yeah, I'm so excited to hear your story, Ingrid. Um, Tony Ann. Uh, Tony Ann is the co-author of Personal Kanban with Jim Benson. And I know, Tony Ann, you're going to share a little bit about the book you have in the works, Kids Bond, which I'm excited to hear more about. Will you share a little bit more about yourself with our audience? Oh, and you're on mute. <laughs> Does that help? So Jim Benson and I have a company called Modus Cooperandi, as well as an online school called Modus Institute, where we talk about things like Kanban and Lean and Agile, but mostly we talk about how to build systems that humanize work that people actually enjoy coming to work for. I love that. Yeah, so important right now. And Dimitri, Dimitri is the CEO and founder of Kanban Zone. You may have heard of Kanban Zone during our, um, our Kanban for Education series. We talked a little bit about how some of the teachers and students were using Kanban Zone for planning out their courses and inviting the students to really participate in um, picking what they were gonna work on next and organizing around their work. Dimitri, will you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Yes, um, I've been um, an Agile coach for 20 years and discovered you know, the benefits of Kanban a few years later. And <clears throat> over the course of helping many, many people feel empowered, to become self-organized and design the ideal process they needed, they kept on running into the same issue of, we just figure out the best way to visualize all this and the tool won't let us do it. So I was crazy enough to launch a Kanban tool uh, five years ago and um, having a lot of fun with it. And although I'm supposed to be focused on B2B and selling to big corporate companies, I am passionate about um, personal Kanban and especially when I see the impact it has on people designing um, the life that they believe um, they deserve and really helping in the family and schools, et cetera. So I'm here to just have fun um, and talk about how to apply Kanban to your personal life. Love it. Okay. Love well, it. you touched okay. on something you touched on that, that I think would be a great starting point for us. You said something here about the power of visualization. There's a million concepts, right, that where we see this in how we organize our lives. You know, there's journaling concepts. Um, there's all these different ways, you know, whether you're using Trello at home or different tools. What makes Kanban different in this sense of from keeping a journal or a planner or a calendar? Um, how does that visualization come in? Dimitri, let's start with you. Well, just to remind the audience, I mean, Kanban literally stands for visual card or signboard, right? So it doesn't matter if you're writing it on the back of a napkin or on a sticky or in a tool. As soon as you visualize, and more importantly, as soon as you write it, it becomes real. And it becomes a commitment to yourself to do something about it. So for me, the first step of visualization, whether it's for anything you do, is writing it down and looking at it and going, you know what? I think I can do this. And that's the beginning of visualization. Without going any further, is there's going to be other things that are going to compete with that, but I'll stop at this. Step one, write it down, make it real, see it, and look at it every day until you get it done. That's my quick one. Yeah, definitely. So I think, um, Tony Ann, do you want to add to that? Sure. So personal Kanban has two roles, and it has two roles for a reason because we like breaking rules because of something we call reactants. So we try to keep it lightweight and simple. So the first rule is to visualize your work. The second rule is to limit your whip. The reason that we have that first rule is because of the pictorial superiority effect is that, you know, we've all heard that a picture is worth a thousand words and we process visual data far quicker than we do text or anything else like that. All right, so it's it's a way to basically extend our capacity, our brain capacity. And you know, a lot of people are very comfortable with to-do lists. And 
one of the things that a to-do list doesn't, doesn't help you do is surface patterns about the way that you work. So one of the things that we've noticed with personal Kanban and visualizing your work on a Kanban is it becomes a metacognitive tool. It starts to surface patterns in the way that you work. What type of work is flowing quickest through the value stream? Who is overloaded? Where does work get bottlenecked the most? So it starts to teach you about the way that you're working. And those are things that we could not learn if our work was just in a spreadsheet or in a to-do list. Yeah. Yeah. And we see that with teams too, right? When we're working with teams to help them understand what's the type of work that's getting stuck. Um, Ingrid, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story here. So what kind of tools you you shared that you, we sucked you into this, this conversation because you told us you used Kanban to plan a wedding, um, which is a great story. I'm excited to hear more about it. Tell us a little bit about the tools that you use or if you did you try anything before you tried applying Kanban to planning your wedding? Yeah, uh, I think the first uh context we need to have is my wife worked with me and we are both agile coaches when we know, when we met each other and we have people who do, who do ceremonials we have a specialist for that so why did not uh we did not contract one uh and the first thing was it's so expensive and we already done many things that they could have for us so we, we talk a lot about um, how can we organize our wedding. And the first thing we, we uh, decided to was why we want to do a, mar a marriage, why we want to do a party for, for our wedding. And then we just start to list things that we need to do. And at the time, I was already a PK trainer. And I said, OK, let's put this on Trello and say see what we need to do. And we found some patterns. So we start to classify our work items. Like uh, we have things that we need to do to each other. We need things that involve people. We have things to involve our mothers because we use our mothers a lot in our wedding. There are things that we need to bought in other city because we live in a small, small city in the, and we need to do, go to the capital to, um, to bought some things. So we start to look at the practice of visualization or workflow. And I like so much the definition of Kanban that is a strategy to optimize your workflow with a, um, a visual, um, okay, uh, a, visu a visual and a pool system because we put the things in the visual way. And the pool system was so amazing because we needed to start to limit it our, our work. Like, how do you manage? Or work, what we need to do. And um, before we, we start this, I was talking with my wife and she said, okay, what was the, the biggest win with using Kanban and applying Kanban to organizing our wedding? And she said, I don't need to uh, charge you for anything because I knew exactly <laughs> what you are doing and I knew exactly what we are needing to decide because we have policies, we have a, a whole workflow, we have things categorized like we need to decide. So it was so amazing because you need to find patterns on what you do in your real life. Yeah. So we, we organize a lot of things with that and it's in a you know, visual tool and an online tool that we can assess every time and we create our, uh, our own policies like we have a weekly and uh, we have plenty and we made a lot of retrospectives uh, and it was, it was amazing. So I, I apply Kanban for everything. I need to organize big things in my life because it works. And the bi the best thing is it works. I love that. Can I? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just to add quickly, so Ingrid, we didn't get a chance to connect before the call, but one of the first board we build is how to plan your wedding. And we built it exactly that with on based on the book of how to plan your baby right nine months in, in advance but we did kind of the same backward and i'm so happy that you're sharing a real story about this and the only thing i'll, I'll mention because i because we keep mentioning tools is um i can't wait to show you kanban zone because the whip limit that tony Ann was talking about does not exist in trello and um is probably one of the key aspects to to make sure that you don't get um overburdened right and that you don't stress too much before your wedding. So I just wanted to put out there that um, I can't wait to show you what we've done because I think you could uh, probably give me some tips on it. Sure. Ingrid, first, congratulations. 
Um, we just spoke with somebody. We just likewise did an interview with somebody who was utilizing Kanban to plan their wedding. And one of the things that I noticed, and I'm sure you probably noticed, is that for the tasks that were combined tasks between he and his wife, they were a certain color. What was really neat for me to see is that the burden of the planning didn't fall just on one person. It, a lot of those tickets were actually the combined tickets for between you know, both partners. And I'm wondering if you saw the same thing, if it balanced the capacity out. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of things that we divided, like you do this and I do that. And there's something like, we need to choose a cake. You need to try a cake. So, okay, you search for uh, the person who can do the cake and we are going to taste together so there's a lot of things that we did, did together because we need to decide it together and many people think about a wedding and think oh okay my wife is going to organize the whole wedding and i just will pay and no we we need to decide things together and it was amazing it's a such experience like organizing was the best experience because the, I, I'm not a party person, so the party was not my my the funniest part for me. But, but the organization was the best thing we can uh, meet. Yeah, and you said something else there, Ingrid, about how you broke the work down. I think that's really interesting. Um, I've tried to help my sister who works in the nonprofit space and puts on a lot of events to help organize her her work with a Kanban board and. I think sometimes we get this mental block about where to start when something's big, right? And you just said, we have to pick out cake vendors and test the cake, right? But that was, if you separate those, then it's a little less daunting because it's like, okay, we have one thing, that's done. We know three places we're going to go test the cake, right? And so if you can make those things as small as possible, um, there is, a, I think, a mental piece of getting things to that done column. Um, Tony, and you talked a little bit about the the happiness, the mental piece of all of this. Can you expand on that a little bit? And those well, like, moments? what you just said, because that was really important. Nobody wants a ticket on their board that says plan wedding, because what that's going to do, it's too big. That is going to shut down your prefrontal cortex and your prefrontal cortex is arguably the reason all of us are knowledge workers. That's our toolkit. That is our higher level functioning. That is our executive functions. That's our decision making, problem solving, prioritization. And if we're scared, if we have that big ticket item, we're going to become overwhelmed. That's going to shut us down. So what we want to do is we want to break those big tasks down into small, tiny chunks, manageable chunks so that we are not only bypassing our amygdala, bypassing that fight or flight mechanism, but we're also getting active. We're also getting action. We're also seeing progress and progress. We know is going back to what you mentioned about happiness. We know that seeing our progress gives us a burst of serotonin. It makes us feel good. They've done studies that show just saying I'm complete, just saying I'm finished gives us that burst of serotonin. But what it likewise does, it gives us that burst of dopamine, right? Which helps us with motivation. So we no longer, you know, just want to start new tasks because that's novelty. We want to complete tasks because that completion likewise gives us that neural reward. And when we're looking at our done column and we see that completion, that makes us feel great. Right. I mean, when we're not visualizing our work, when we're not visualizing our completion, then we feel we've we've accomplished nothing at the end of the day when we probably have been busy from, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours. So we need that visual feedback and that contributes to our sense of happiness as well. Definitely. Yeah. Those small wins. Dimitri, tell us more. Before we get off the topic of love and romance. <laughs> I want to make sure we talk about that after the wedding, we also have another template for couples in love. And what I want to put on the table is often we transform an organization and every, everything works out. We plan a wedding, everything works out, and then we go back to our old ways. How about we continue using Kanban for everything else? And the one that I really love is um, couples in love. It's, it's a real board, by the way. And the reason I, I, I built it is because everyone was making fun of me that you plan your date nights? I'm like, of course I plan my date nights. If you don't plan them, you never go on dates. And when you do, well, it's like last minute and you got to like find a restaurant. So I just want to put on the table that I love starting with, hey, let's get married and build a board. But let's, especially if it work, let's see if we can. And I'm not talking only about putting the honey-do list to make your partner do all the chores at home, right? That's a great board too. But I'm talking about <laughs> planning for fun things, right? And also using this visualization to learn from it and say, you know what? I hate dancing. Of course, I'm going to be dragged to a dancing class. Well, 
let's try it once. Let's make it a card. Let's find something that's agreeable for me to, you know, work myself up to go dancing. But you know what? If I don't like it, then put it in the column of let's not do that one again. And my point is, is I believe relationships are a lot of work. <laughs> and I, I think that there's um, even a silly, simple board, right, can continue to keep at least not the romance alive, but the 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 conscious planning of I care enough about you to continue putting great ideas that we can look at together and build a life together. Sorry, I'm going to stop being all uh, gushy about this. May, may I extend something that Dimitri so brilliantly stated? Yeah. It's not just about the honeydew list. So um, my friend and colleague, David Marlowe, is known as the Ikigai guy. And Ikigai, that concept of, you know, understanding your purpose in life. And I started to work with the Kanban utilizing color to make sure that different components of my own life were being satisfied. So that at the end of the week, I wasn't just pulling, let's say, red tickets and green tickets, which were, you know, class related tickets and client related tickets. But I started pulling tickets for like spirituality and I started pulling tickets for health and I started pulling tickets for socialization, because especially after the past two and a half years, I think so many of us have just become hermits. And I started to notice patterns. I started to notice, well, wow, I'm focusing way too much on work. I'm focusing way too much on social life. So. Being able to build a board that is, as Dimitri quite rightly says, is beyond just your honeydew list. Yes, Kanban works amazing for distributing chores in a household. It absolutely does. But that's, I think that that's just one part of its utility. And I think especially now, I don't believe in, in Dimitri and I had a beautiful conversation a couple of days ago. We talked about, you know, how we tend to bifurcate our lives between work life and personal life. And I don't believe you can do that. I think it's an unnatural way of separating your life. So what I'm hoping that Kanban can help us all do, and tools like Kanban visualization and collaboration tools, is help us look for a healthy integration. You know, try to satisfy all those parts of the life. So at the end of the day, we're just not you know productivity machines, but we're actually living our lives. It was pretty uh, interesting that you talk about the seeing the done things. And if you don't like a dancing uh, class or you're doing that, um, it's like you have the feedback. Like you mm -hmm. see the things done, now you can see that. And uh, it's not about the done, but what do you learn with the done thing? What the value that um, you created with that? Like it's just what it was just a funny moment together or we discover something new or discover a new hobby. And you can measure that progress, like you yeah. classify your the things that you've done. And if you put something like you can go further and put cycle times and like, OK, I have this idea that we can go to a dancing class. How long, how much time we spend to starting doing this or wh uh, when we started and when we uh, commit to each other to do something like that so you can start to me measure uh, how committed you are with your personal life and how you're prioritizing yourself like you can see that and you can get uh, you can have this feedback and it's pretty fun because there's a lot of things you can see of Kanban and you can apply your life and say okay it makes sense so why are not doing that already yeah yeah, and it's not just it's not just cycle time, right? I think that's where work being able to visualize how old a ticket is, whether it's in your backlog of dates. Like if that dancing card is is three months old, maybe it's never going to get pulled. You know, get it out of the backlog. But I think looking at your in progress um, aging work is so important when it's a personal item because. Um, you know, once you have that whip established, it's really easy to say, especially if your whip's more than one, right? It's really easy to have something that may age there forever because you can keep working around it. Um, and I and I think without an external person to be like, hey, this card's two weeks old. Are you ever going to prioritize this work, right? We own that piece. And so I think that's where having that visual feedback is not just about the, the distribution of, I'll say distribution of work, even though we're talking about distribution of attention really here with with how we're spending our time. But I think also being able to have the feedback of how long has this item been in progress becomes even more critical as a way to, to push yourself. Tony Ann, how about from a, um, so I know you're, you're, you're working on a book about kids, Kanban. Um, I've shared this story a few times, but when, when COVID first hit, 
I had three kids at home. Um, Kanban saved, I think, my my marriage and my parenting <laughs> because um, I was on Zoom. My husband was on Zoom all day, and we created a Kanban board for basically once your schoolwork is done. You know, twenty you need each need to do twenty minutes of something outside, twenty minutes of playing your instrument, twenty minutes of reading. Um, and when all of, you know, it was like, make sure your bed is made, make sure you've, make sure you've checked all these things. When your cards are all to the done column, um, you can come and, and ask me for screen time, but don't talk to me until everything's in the done column. And what was fascinating about that process was giving the kids, I mean, diff all different ages, giving the kids control of getting their things to done. My oldest would have everything to the done column in two hours, and he would have his day free to play video games. My daughter would get everything to the done column maybe two minutes before it was dinner time. <laughs> Same tasks, same things they had to do. So let's talk a little bit about that, you know, with kids especially. How And Dimitri, I know you're working with, with um, education right now too. Let's talk about that sense of ownership that personal Kanban gives you around decision-making and prioritization. Tony, and you want to take that first? So you, you nailed it, agency. Agency for me has been the secret sauce in seeing the success with kids, with anybody. I mean, we know from um, the SCARF method that came out of, um, from David Rock, of Dr. David Rock of the Neuro Leadership Institute, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. All of those things can either you know, be threatened or they can be used, used as a reward. And we know, especially with kids, that sense of agency, that sense of control over their lives within certain boundaries, of course, is, is vitally important. You know, when we started with personal Kanban, we thought when we started writing those first three blog posts, we thought that we would hear from software developers because Jim had a software company and, you know, he was writing about utilizing with tech, tech companies. And um, we heard from parents which was really interesting. Um, a lot of them obviously had come from either being agile or lean coaches. And um, we heard, one of the first people that we heard from was this single mom of three. And she had explained that every morning it was an absolute nightmare getting her kids out the door. And so what she did is she put a small board like low on the wall, because I think the youngest one was like four or five. And then she had another one that was probably like eight. And then I think the other one was pushing like the tween years. And so what she would do is she would have each of their names on tickets. And um, for the little one, she wouldn't have words. She would have images. So one was like a toothbrush. One was a backpack to make sure their bag was packed. And she said what was happening was every day the kids were competing with each other to pull their tickets into done. And one ticket, if it would get stuck in doing, the other kids would swarm on it. And that's another thing that we've noticed with visualization is that it engages that non-selfish gene that Johan Benko talks about. You know, that when we see somebody stuff we you know we have this sense that we want to help them we have this sense of altruism and so they were helping the little one you know teaching the little one how to make their bed or helping them pull that ticket into done and she told us she says there were no more arguments in the morning and the kids were getting to the door five minutes ten minutes before but one of the most profound uses that i've ever I had the honor of, of witnessing was we were at an organization in Vaughan, Ontario, and it was during lunch. And one of the women said to us, said, said to me, Hey, you know, can I talk to you about my son? He's a slacker. We just moved to, we just moved to Canada. He's a total slacker. He was doing great over, you know, and, and they, they lived in, uh, I think in Ukraine. And, um, I asked her, I said, well, can you, can you please, can we, we put together a rudimentary board? Could you please write down all the tasks that he has? You know at what you know what you want him to do every day what you want him to do three times a week and she put all the tasks down and she visualized them and then she started to cry and she said i had no idea i was doing that to my child and you know i i had to hold back tears it was that was a tough one it was a tough one because there was something like 10 tasks that he was expected to do outside of school and none of them were play so the first thing that we did we, we had her sit down and make a commitment to him that for every X amount of tickets related to school and education and, you know, violin practice, he would, he would pull a play ticket. And that was really profound awesome. to see yeah. that. But again, as, as Ingrid said, that visual feedback, right? That, that understanding that when you're not visualizing what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. You certainly don't understand your capacity and you certainly can't convey that capacity to somebody else. And so unfortunately he suffered, he suffered being called a slacker when he just didn't have the capacity for anything. He didn't have the capacity to be a child. Yeah. Wow. 
Go ahead. Tom. And, and, uh, and uh, Colleen, there's a, there's a little topic I want to add because I, I love that we're still, you know, talking about the power of visualization and, and the story that Tony Ann just told us is, you know, immediate, immediate feedback on what was going on. There's a principle in Kanban that I want to make sure we mention, which is encouraging acts of leadership at every level. And the reason I want to mention that is that we've talked about a key role in this conversation we just had, which is the parent. I do a lot of work in schools and I was, a, I am a parent still, she's just <laughs> old now, but um, um, my point is this, parents are part of the solution. Parents are not supposed to just send their kids to school and expect miracles. When parents actually take care of talking to their children every day, looking at what they're doing, imagine if they had a way to visualize it and to actually do the work that a parent is supposed to do instead of just giving it to teachers who are overwhelmed already and need the support, encouraging acts of leadership. And I'm not going to go all Caesar Milan on you or all Oprah, but my point is, is that the parents has a role to play in it and the parent needs to get to work in understanding how to visualize what is really going on in the life of their kids so they can, instead of doing their kids' homework, help them plan better, help them understand and share emotions. So I want to make sure that we talk about acts of leadership that of course can come from the child, but can come from other roles that sometimes are completely missing and we need them desperately. So just want to put a, a little note on the leadership that comes part of the Kanban methodology. Definitely. Tony, and you also mentioned something interesting in your story about the board for getting ready for school around the kids swarming. And Ingrid, I'd love to hear a little bit more. You said something really interesting about your wedding board that stood out to me about the mother, mother and mother-in-law tasks, which after planning a wedding, I feel like their involvement can make or break your, your success here. So I'd be curious to hear more when you had those tasks that were maybe dependent on other folks in the planning process or involved, you know, getting getting approval, right? Getting sign off from other parts of your wedding planning group. How did you involve them in, in your Kanban board or Kanban conversations? Yeah, uh, I'd like to just include something about um, when you give autonomy to a child, yeah. they can develop better. Like I am uh, youngest than all of you. I lived with my mom, I, I don't know, four years ago, I was in my mother's house. And there's a lot of trade-offs when we do things like we have a prize, like you, you do something, you, you earn a prize and you need to see like that. We need to have some deadlines. We need to have commitment and we need to deliver things and we need to know why. And when we know that why, uh, it's so much better because you understand um, why people are doing that or people are charging of you to, to doing that things. Um, when we need to do things with our mothers, um, it became, it was the part that became not so funny because <laughs> when you just need to involve two people that think in the same way and are committed with the same process, it's so much easier. And we put that, uh, we had a, 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 um, a ticket in our trial that say moms. And we needed to divide uh, the, the tasks with our mothers because both of them uh, love arts, love doing uh, manual work, and one live in our, uh, in our city and the other not. So we need to say, okay, mom, you do this and the other mom did that. And we need to put them together sometimes to talk and to share because uh, it creates a competition. And it's very hard because people want to participate of the things. And we need to see that and we need to manage other people in our workflow. And, and it's very interesting because when it becomes about the other and not yourself, not your house or not the things that you can control, you need to have a lot of um, emotional intelligence to, to deal with that because it's not about your work but it's about much more about managing their emotions than managing what they need to deliver because they they have the things done at the time uh you need to if we we had a deadline with them they would deliver at the at the day but the the most um challenging part about moms and about other people in your system is that managing their emotions, managing how they will dealt with your um, 
your third way of thinking and the things that you want to do. So they need to, you need to fix some things in the way. Colleen, you mentioned Colleen, an you important know. word. You mentioned dependencies. Whether it is planning a wedding or enjoying a marriage, whether it is with schoolwork or family chores, whether it is with an organization, dependencies beget silos, and silos are where information and learning go to die. And so coming from an organization called Modus Cooperandi, I, I recoil sometimes when I hear the term dependencies. I like to make silos as porous as possible because, again, going back to happiness, Tony Shea had said, of, of Zappos had said something to the effect of, happiness is not an inside job. Happiness is something that comes between us. And that's where I've seen a lot of the magic of Kanban. It's in those opportunities for collaboration and feedback. And there's seldom, it's seldom a, a, an instance of, well, Dimitri, this is my work and that's your work and never the twain should be. You know, we know collaboration spurs a lot more learning and is a lot more, uh, you'll, you'll often get a much more vital, sustainable product. From that. Go ahead, Dimitri. Just before we get off on the topic of, of children is um, I just want to make sure that I share with everyone that no matter whether I'm training executives or, or doing personal, I always tell the story of my daughter and I don't want to, I want to talk about life. And for me, life ended up in a divorce. And the challenge was that she was only six and every set Friday I picked her up and every Sunday her mom would pick her back up. And on Sundays, her mom would come to the door and say, hey, honey, what'd you do this weekend? And my wonderful daughter, Chloe, would go, nothing. And I was like, that's it. Next Friday, Kanban board in the kitchen. You will list your goals for the weekend. We will fold them on the board. And on Sunday, the answer to mommy is what's in the done column. True story, right? So obviously, my poor daughter uh, did Kanban when she was six. But what it did is it embraced a new stage of life that I was not comfortable with. And... I knew nothing else than to, you know, visualize happiness because I thought I was ha doing happy things with my daughter, but it wasn't coming through. And in the end, I can't say that it rekindled my relationship with my ex-wife. We're great friends now. But on Sundays, both parents were pretty proud about, you know, our daughter telling us, you know what, I actually did something this weekend. And it's not just a pack of gum that my dad bought me at the store. It was a little bit more meaningful than that. And so I just want to say that, you know, Kids are wonderful. Our first post on our group, Kanban to Improve the World, was exactly that. A dad, again, that was trying to adopt, uh, to adopt Kanban to his kids. And I just want to make sure that every, I mentioned that every stage of life, right? I'm not saying you need to do Kanban all the time. But when you're lost and you just don't know what to do, I think it's kind of helpful. I'll leave it yeah. at that. Yeah. May I just say one more thing? Just to tie, tie a bow on the whole happiness concept. Um, arguably... The best metric, whether it's in a marriage or whether it's with your kids or whether it's in your organization, are happy people. Because happy people are going to create happy product, right? Or kind of create a good product. Um, happy happy people don't don't cause risk. Happy people aren't a quality issue. And so what we've started doing is we've started documenting metrics, uh, super, super, super difficult metric on our tickets, is when somebody pulls a ticket into done, how did that ticket make you feel? Document your subjective well-being. Did it make you feel accomplished? Did it make you feel happy? Put a little, put a little happy face. You know, were you kind of ambivalent? Put a little, you know, ambivalent face. And did it upset you? All right? And so here, wait, yeah, yeah all right unhappy face and again going back to the feedback that we were talking about looking at that done column i would argue the value of kanban is not always recognized in your definition of done because for me the definition of not done is not the completion of the task it's what did we learn from the task mm -hmm. so if you recognize that a certain type of sticky note or a certain type of task is always causing an individual to be upset that's a conversation because that's a quality issue Stop the stop the proverbial line, pull the proverbial land on board, have a conversation about why did this upset you? Well, maybe, you know, Dimitri, in your case, maybe it would have been like, Dad, I'm tired of going to movies every week. I don't want to do movies. All right, so there's that feedback. Or mom, you know what? They're always on the tickets with the with the violin. I don't want to do violin. I want to play the drums. But the conversations that getting that feedback 
he gets, I think that's the value. Well, not, yeah. Tony, and you totally went where I was headed with that too, was just around the concept of that feedback loop that Ingrid talked about and how do we fold that learning? It's basically a personal retrospective at that point, right? Of looking at all of that information. And I think your story too about um, all of the tasks in the done, the done column are work-related, we're not fulfilling or don't have smiley faces are really important when we think about that personal motivation to get those things to done. Um, you know, from a personal perspective, you could have your done column full and feel very accomplished, like you got a bunch of tasks complete, but if none of them have that smiley face or none of them are things that you enjoy doing or feel like they're fulfilling, I, you, you're probably missing that dopamine hit that you talked about, right, of, of I'm excited to go in there and accomplish more. Um, before we open things up for questions, and we've got some some folks in the group here, um, feel free if you're listening live to start adding questions into the comments there, and we'll run through some some questions with our panel. Um, Dimitri, I want to go back over to you real quick. You had talked about a couple templates for marriage, for for date nights. Tell us some more applications you've built out here for um, other ways you can use Kanban in your personal life. Well, one of the ones that I use all the time and is one of our templates is definitely vacation planning. The reason vacation planning is very powerful is it takes time to plan. You need to research. You need to think which, what's the best time of the year? What is your budget? What are the points of interest? So the Kanban board has a few thinking columns first to really think out your, your vacation. But then because our tool is more than a Kanban board, it also visualizes anything you want. I build it, I know it's going to sound very professional, but I build it like a roadmap with four quarters. And I put all the best trips in each of the quarters so that I can visualize, hey, listen, I got nothing going on in Q3. Should I go to Barbados or should I go to Costa Rica? And the two cards are ready. I could go to either one. And I go, I'll go to Costa Rica. And my point is, you can use Kanban for the planning process. You can use uh, our templates and tools to also visualize them in other mechanism than purely going from left to right. And then obviously you can document on your cards what happened during the trip and what to do again. So vacation planning is definitely one of our best templates, but the one that I wanna make sure I put on the table is we do have a, a weekly planning or a personal convon. And I, I, I gotta tell you, starting personal convon with the first card being your personal mission statement. For me, that's a good card to start with. It's the one that starts with, who am I? Why do I exist? <laughs> right? The, the fun questions, right? Am I going heavy? Yes. But I'm thinking if you're going to use a technique like Kanban and try to do great things, you know, some of our templates are meant to challenge you to say, you know, have you taken a moment in your life to do a self-actualization? Do you know where you are today? And how about you write it down as a personal mission statement or another way of documenting it. So many templates that are around personal Kanban, but I got to tell you the vacation one, you will save money. You will have the best vacation you've ever had. And I'm telling you, it's 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 magical. And that's how my daughter calls my Kanban boards. They're magical. So those are some of the templates, Colleen. Thank you for asking because there's, there's a bunch of them, but I'm also um, excited for people to build their own and they don't have to be complicated. So I want to make sure for some of our listeners, we talk about tools, we talk about process. Guys, it's just stickies on, on a board, right? So I want to make sure we don't go too far away also from starting very simple. Yeah. Well, we've got some great questions along those lines. I'm going to start with the one here from David that um, Tony Ann mentioned using color tickets and asked what other visual cues work well when collaborating. Tony Ann, do you want to take that? Shape, shape and avatar. So when we um, at Modus, we use an obeya which is um, a Japanese word for great room. It's, it's where we have all of our documents and visualizations and ways that we've um, solved problems. And it's basically every, everything that we need to run our organization. And what Jim and I and David try to do is we try to create as much information at a glance that will give you information. So it's not like you have to go in there and I have to put my glasses on, I have to read what's going on. But I can see if I see things moving through the value stream and I see it's in a certain shape, I will know what type of work that is. Or if I see David's head on way too many sticky notes, I will know David is way over capacity and we have to have a conversation about why he's getting so much work. Um, but surfacing patterns um, in any way that you possibly can, shape, size, color, um, anything that is, um, also I wanted to say is make sure you have a legend for your own group 
because you will come to the point where you will have your own folksonomy, your own language for your group and let the group choose that. Give them agency over that because then it will stick. So yeah, that's a great question. Anything to surface pattern. Yeah. And yeah. And I would add date started. You know, I talked about a little bit about work item age. I think for me, looking at how old the ticket is, is motivating to me to get things over the finish line sometimes. When and, I if it, it if it is, and if it is aging, break it down. Right. You know, yeah. Break that ticket down. If you feel you're not getting momentum on it, just break it down. Again, don't scare your, you know, don't engage your fight or flight mechanism. Yeah. Once you get a little bit of progress on it, you'll see you have that momentum and you'll want to do more of that particular ticket. Yeah. Um, you do have a question here. What are some tips to introduce a Kanban board to young children? Is that for me? You, yeah. You want to start with that one? I think that's um, you know what? Start small. Start with images. Um, you do. What what age are we talking about? We have an age. Maybe we can consider five years old, or like Dimitri. Uh, um, okay, so for the for the super little had six. for su for super little ones, I would stick to images. Mm. You no, know, I would stick to images like um, you know a bed for making your bed or a toothbrush for brushing teeth. You know, start with an options of doing a done column. And then at the end, maybe put a little star or something like that. One of the conversations that we've been in and um, with a lot of parents is it seems like parents are split 50-50 between whether or not they want to monetize or give some type of a, a, an, extra, an extrinsic reward um, for completion. Um, I am of the belief that the kids are realizing their success and that's enough of a reward for a lot of kids. So it's up, I leave that up to the parents, but starting small, don't overwhelm them, allow them to see their progress and then increasingly add more things to the options column. And likewise, I would lower their whip limit to no more than two tickets in doing it at any given, at any given point. Yeah. Dave Pryor added a note here that said, "Had have them be dazzle their boards. I love that, Dave. When when we had our Kanban board for the kids, I got magnets that they each got to decorate to control their whip. Um, and so it was really fun to see the different magnets from each kid that they either painted or stuck glitter and stuff on. And that was their their in-progress magnet. We've got another- Real quick on that. Yeah. I, just, I just wanna add, if you go on Pinterest, yes, we have a Pinterest channel, but we have a bunch of pictures of what kids actually do. Whether they're adults or three to five, which was the answer to the age, um, make them build the board that's that, that's powerful whether you, whether it's putting tape on a wall um i think building the board is really important to uh, to be part of the beginning experience absolutely yeah a sense of agency dimitri i think this next question here has a great is a great one for you in thinking about that alignment to what am i doing this for yuri says um how do you think it would or how do you think would would it be a great help if on top of the kanban board you had a dream board and what will it give in addition besides following the dreams? Do you want to talk about that? Absolutely. So I've, there's actually a thing called a dream coach. It's a it's a real thing. And I've worked with them. And that's exactly it. So you nailed it, Yuri, is that my take is that your dreams could be your top strategies. Or if we're talking marketing, there would be your top campaigns. I think your dreams or top goals should be cards that don't move as often and could be at a flight level called dream. And then below that flight level could be more of the more day-to-day -day or weekly things you do, but that fulfill most of them your dreams, but some do not. Some are your honey-do list, right? But my point is, I love where you're going with a two-flight board, two-flight level board, a dream or strategic level, and then a more like weekly or task-driven thing. So nailed it, Yuri. Okay. I love, uh, I think that you you bring an important point that's goals we need to have goals like if you have just a can member with a lot of tasks you, it's just about the tasks but the why the why is the whole point about it because when we talk about kanban and people start using kanban or applying in their teams or your in their personal lives there they miss the goal the results of things the what the outcome so the goals uh should be place somewhere and it's okay to change i think it's really okay to you to adapt and okay now i achieved that so what's the next or okay I, I, it's not make sense anymore so what's the next one and it's okay you to change and to try 
Ingrid, you know, when I love what you're putting on the table is when you know the other cards move fast, but the dream ones or the goal ones, they don't move as fast. But when they move, <laughs> then you're allowed to put a new dream or you're allowed to put a new goal. So I, I, I think the flight levels really bring a different sense of accomplishment. Some are long term and trigger you. You talked about pull system to say, well, I finished a dream. What's my next one? If I may add one thing to that, I love the word try because I love the word experiment. When we wrote the personal Kanban book, the first column was to do. And we recognized that people were not scrutinizing what was in their to do column. It became a mandate. They had to do it. Now, if you have a to do and it is December 26th and it says buy a Christmas gift, cows are ready out of the barn. You know, that option is expired. So we changed that column to options because we want people to be cognizant of not just their context, but is that ticket of value anymore to you personally? So maybe that dream that once mattered when you were, you know, 25 years old no longer matters when you're 30. So always be scrutinizing those things that you have on your board. They're not etched in stone. View everything as an experiment. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for joining us today. If there are there any other questions before we wrap up our, our podcast today? Oh, one more here. Maria is asking, would you recommend a digital life board or a physical one? Ingrid, let's I, I'd love to hear this answer from everyone. Ingrid, let's start with you. Uh, depends on what you need to do, because um, thinking about things that maybe you need to access anywhere. Uh, like uh, organize your wedding or you need to bought something or you need to access. Uh, it's good you have your uh, digital board, but thinking about children or thinking about uh, imagination or things that you need to do at your house. So I, I recommend the physical one. I have a physical one board in my house. And for big things, I have digital ones. So I use both, but depends on what you need to do. Dimitri, you want to share your thoughts on physical versus digital? Yeah, coming from the guy who sells a digital board, here's the key. <laughs> um, I'm traveling right now, and I won't lie to you, my laptop is a Kanban board. On the left of my uh, mouse pad, well, my, my, my tracker pad is my to-do. On the right of it is my done, right? My point is that my laptop itself serves as a physical board. When I'm back home, which I'll be tonight, I do have a tiny, tiny physical board. It's just the obvious stuff. My point is, and I agree with Ingrid, when we're talking about dreams or personal life statement or vacation, you need a digital board. You need to track this. You need to be able to collaborate. You need to, right? But those are longer term and, and more like, you know, envisioning cycles. But I rarely don't have a mini uh, physical board that I invent quickly on the fly. I think the best tool is the one that you will use. Yeah. Right. But I'm, my setup is exactly the same as Dimitri's. I have my online board because I collaborate with people around the world. I have my physical board on the wall. And I likewise have my morning to do with all my sticky notes on one side of my monitor. My done column is on the other side. So the thing about a visual radi radiator is when you turn it off, it is no longer a visual radiator. So just keep that in mind. But if it's important to you, visualize it. It's the most important thing. Great. Well, thank you all. I loved this conversation. It was so fun to step outside of thinking about software for, for today and think about how we can take this home. It's funny, you know, the questions that came up today and the things we talked about were really inspiring to me to get back in and <laughs> take a look at my personal Kanban system and probably go through, break a few things down um, a little smaller that have been stuck and also think about how to align it there with my dreams and goals for, for this year and beyond. So I'm excited to put some of this back into practice for myself too. So I appreciate all the insights and the, the great advice you offered to everybody here. Um, we will post this recording under the Kanban for Everyone channel on YouTube. So if you missed it or you want to share with anybody that wasn't able to watch us live, the link will be there on YouTube. Um, in two weeks, we'll be getting back together to talk about Kanban for HR. So if you know anybody who's in the HR space or or have used Kanban for HR, please reach out and we'll, um, we'll be posting the link to join that conversation two weeks from today. Huge thank you to Ingrid, Tony Ann, and Dimitri. Thank you. And have a great thank day, everyone. You, everyone. Super fun. Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.